Good morning. It's a joy and privilege to open up the Word with you this morning. And as we begin, I'd like to ask you a couple questions. What are you doing, and why are you doing it? Any of us who've had the privilege of knowing and interacting with young kids have almost certainly heard these questions on repeat. Well, Roseanne and I don't yet have any children of our own. We have been blessed to live, as many of you know, on the campus of Heritage College and Seminary for the last two and a half years. And while living amongst the students and constantly interacting with staff and faculty has been an immense joy and blessing to us, one of the greatest joys has been living across the hall from the Mutas. We've learned so much from this incredible family as they seek to raise their kids in such an interesting context. But let's face it, the vast majority of the learning has come from our daily interactions with Elias, Gracie, and Rosie. And one of the wisest recurring lessons that these little professors have taught us began within the first 48 hours of settling into our apartment on campus. And the lesson comprised just two questions, which we have been asked just about every morning since. What are you doing? And why are you doing it? And this has become something of a morning routine in our house, but the cross-examination that we receive each day as we head out the door has become much more than an endear a display of endearing curiosity. You see, it's actually become a constant reminder to consider what is at the core of everything that we do. The beauty of this line of questioning is that whether we feel rested or drained, whether we feel prepared for the day or behind on our work, whether we're on time or running late, those kids are going to make sure that we have an opportunity to reflect on what we are doing that day and why we are doing it. Do you ever ask yourself those questions? Do you ever have time to? Well, let me ask you now. When you're 10 minutes late, but you're finally in the car and you're on your way to work, do you sit at that red light and ask yourself, what am I doing? And why am I doing it? As you walk down the sidewalk on your way to school in the morning, do you ever question why you're going to school in the first place? Like, why not just keep walking? How about when you're sitting in the rocking chair with baby for the fifth time that night? Do you ever wonder why it is that you're doing all that you're doing? How about this morning? Maybe you've been gathering with these wonderful people for decades. Have you ever stopped to ask what it really is that this is all about? Now, Elias, Gracie, and Rosie are likely not trying to confront us with the reality of human purpose and motivation. They just want to know if we're up to anything interesting and weigh whether or not it might be worth tagging along. But these are very big questions for very little people because they're questions that get at the very heart of the Christian life. And this morning, friends, I want to consider these questions together. What are we doing and why are we doing it? And my desire is to consider what Scripture says is at the very heart of what matters for us as a community of faith and what ought to be fueling us as we pursue it. So to that end, would you open your copies of the Scriptures to Deuteronomy chapter 6, where we'll be looking at just two verses, verses 4 and 5. And I believe that's on page 151 in those blue Bibles, uh, which if you do not have a copy with you, you can take home with you. Page 151. And you know what? I'm going to ask if you can stand for the reading of God's Word. Friends, this is what Holy Scripture says. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, and with all your soul, and with all your might. You may be seated as I pray. Almighty and everlasting God, we humbly come before your throne this morning, so grateful for the opportunity to gather, so grateful for the chance to hear from you. And Lord, I pray that the words of my mouth and the meditation of all our hearts would be acceptable in your sight, O oh Lord, my strength and my redeemer. Amen. Now, perhaps you might be wondering, of all the places that we could have gone in Scripture that drive at the heart of what it is that God's people 
ought to be doing and why they are doing it. Why Deuteronomy 6? Well, I'm glad you asked. Because Deuteronomy is itself one of the most influential books in the entire Old Testament. See, it's the theological ground for most of the books that follow. It is to the Old Testament what Romans might be to the New Testament. See, the book of Deuteronomy is Moses' valedictory speech, his swan song, in which he gives the final words that he has to a redeemed people of God at what's a significant turning point in the biblical storyline. Moses is like a father dropping off his son or daughter at university or college for the first time, and he's trying to get 18 years of wisdom out in the parking lot. And as the people are about to enter into the land that was promised to their ancestors, Deuteronomy is Moses' final call to the people of God to remember who their God is, what he's done for them, and then how they ought to live in light of that salvation and blessing. In fact, the book of Deuteronomy is like one giant answer to the what and the why questions for the people of Israel. And now Deuteronomy 6, the chapter we're in this morning, is a pivotal chapter within this pivotal book. And the two verses that we are considering, especially this morning, is among the most important creeds in the whole Bible. One writer says that it makes sense of all the rest of the laws by focusing Israel's attention on the character of God and then upon the only reasonable human response to that character. So these verses could be seen as a starting point for understanding what the people of God are to do and why they are to do it. But the text is going to take some unpacking before we get there. Look with me at verse 4, where it says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. So, the verse begins with a call for the people of God to hear. Now, the Hebrew word is Shema. I only tell you because it's fun to say. And this, of course, becomes the name for the whole prayer, right? The Shema. Now, Shema is an interesting term. It is a word that implies the act of hearing with the ear. But it also implies paying attention, understanding, or even obeying, depending on the context. So in Genesis 18, verse 10, when the Lord was speaking to Abraham about Sarah, who was to have a son, we're told that Sarah was Shema. She was listening at the tent door. But in Job chapter 13, verses 1 and 2, Job declares, Behold, my eye has seen all this, and my ear has heard Shema and understood it. Do you see? There's the second piece. But just like when my mom used to, or when my dad used to say, I should say, Jacob, listen to your mother. This was not a call for me to hear my mother with my ears, and it wasn't even a call for me just to understand what my mother said. She wanted me to do something. So like in Exodus 18, verse 24, where it says that Moses listened, Shema, to the voice of his father-in-law, and he did all that he said, you see. So picture the scene with me. Moses stands before the entire congregation of Israel on the plains of Moab. And he says to them, Shema Yisrael. Hear, O Israel. Listen to me carefully. I'm about to tell you something incredibly important. I am about to give you not just something that you should be doing, but I'm going to tell you why you should be doing it. And as the congregation of Israel leans in, so do we. And Moses says, The Lord our God, the Lord is one. Words that have become among the most important for the enti in the entire Old Testament for the Jewish people. Words that they continue to repeat daily in their prayers. And many of us have also heard these words many times over the course of our lives, but do we really understand what they mean? The declaration begins with the Lord our God. So have you ever wondered why sometimes the word Lord is entirely capitalized and sometimes it isn't? You've probably heard this, many of you, a thousand times. But whenever you see the word Lord in all caps, it's not referring to a title for God, it's referring to his name. Did you know that God has one of those? It's Yahweh, a name that he has chosen for himself. Now, the first time that God explains why he chose this name for himself is in Exodus chapter 3, which we looked at some months ago. This is where God appears to Moses in a burning bush, right? And he calls Moses to be the one who's going to lead his people 
out of slavery and bondage in Egypt into the land that God had promised generations before. And of course, Moses tries to stall. So he starts asking a bunch of questions, right? And one of the questions that he asks God is, well, what do I tell them when they ask me what your name is? And what does God say? I am who I am. That is who I am and who I will be depends on absolutely nothing other than myself. I have always been. I was never created. I will have no end. I am. Now, of course, it would be a little bit strange for Moses to show up to the enslaved Hebrew people and then to tell them, I am who I am, right? So in the next verse, God tells to the people, or tells Moses to say to the people, Yahweh, that is, he will be, has sent me to you. Yahweh is God's name. And as we keep reading in the book of Exodus, we learn that this name is particularly precious to the people of God because it calls to mind something important about God's character, that he's relational, that he wants to have a relationship with his people and that he will go to great lengths to establish that relationship with those he loves. Listen to what Yahweh says to Moses in Exodus chapter 6, which we just looked at a couple of weeks after that. It says, I am Yahweh. I appeared to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob as God Almighty, but by my name, Yahweh, I did not make myself known to them. I also established my covenant with them to give them the land of Canaan, the land in which they lived as sojourners. Moreover, I have heard the groaning of the people of Israel whom the Egyptians hold as slaves, and I have remembered my covenant. Say therefore to the people of Israel, I am Yahweh. I will bring you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians, and I will redeem you with an outstretched arm and with great acts of judgment. I will take you to be my people, and I will be your God. And you shall know that I am Yahweh, your God, who brought you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians. I will bring you into the land that I swore to give to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob. I will give it to you for a possession. I am Yahweh. So Yahweh was more than just a name. It was a reminder of a God who had covenanted with his people, who promised to redeem them from slavery, to establish a relationship with them, and to bring them into a land of their very own, a place where God would dwell in the midst of his people. Now remember the setting of Deuteronomy 6. The children of those very people who had been redeemed from slavery were now standing on the edge of the promised land as a living testament to the fact that Yahweh, this relational God, kept his promise. They were right there. He accomplished what he promised. He rescued his people from slavery. He established a covenant with them. So now, this wasn't just any old God. But these people could say, Yahweh, our God. You see that in the text. The Lord our God, it says. In just two words in the Hebrew, the people are given an identity. Yahweh is our God, a God who redeemed us, a God who desires a relationship with us. The Lord, Yahweh, our God. What a thought. But Moses continues. Having reminded the people of the redeeming relational God who was their God, he then makes a foundational statement about this God. He says, Yahweh is one. Now, this may seem straightforward, but in reality, it's really not as clear as we might think that it is. Because again, though it's just two words in the Hebrew, it's not all that easy to translate. There's at least three different ways that people have tried to make sense of these two words. Some understand Moses to be saying that there's only one God in existence, Yahweh. We might call this a monotheistic reading. You've heard that word before, right? Monotheism, one God. Now, of course, the Bible is undoubtedly monotheistic. There may be many little gods who God created, right? Many little angels and spiritual beings. But there is one true and eternal creator God. But is this what Deuteronomy 6.4 is trying to communicate? Some interpreters don't think so. Some prefer to understand Moses to be making a statement not about how many gods exist, but about how many gods Israel is to worship. One. They tend to translate the verse then as Yahweh our God, Yahweh alone 
which is a perfectly legitimate translation. Still another group disagrees with both of these. They don't think that Yahweh is one, refers to the number of gods in existence, or even the number of gods that Israel should worship. They think it refers to the number of different personalities of Yahweh. You see, the ancient Near East, as you know, believed in many gods, right? But you know what's truly terrifying? They didn't just believe that there were many gods, but that each of those gods had many different personalities and can manifest themselves in many different ways depending on the place that they were and the people who they revealed themselves to. So there could be a Yahweh of Shechem and a Yahweh of Bethlehem and a Yahweh of Jerusalem, and we don't know how to please each of these gods with their different personalities. So while God might have the same name, you never knew what version you were going to get that day. So some think that Yahweh is one means that there is only one manifestation of Yahweh. So which is it? Is there only one God in existence? Is there only one God worthy of our worship? Or is there only one manifestation of God? And the answer, of course, is yes. Yes, there's only one God. Yes, there's only one God then who is true and eternal and worthy of our worship. And yes, he does not change and have many different personalities or manifestations. See, the concern with how so many people try to interpret this verse is that to emphasize just one of these readings is to reduce the Shema to a matter of arithmetic, of numbers. But friends, this verse isn't about numbers. It's about categories. Yahweh is one. And in declaring this, Moses is saying that Yahweh our God is supreme. That he's in a category all by himself. That he and he alone is worthy of the category God and all that entails. And what does that entail? That there's only one true God. And that Yahweh alone is worthy of our worship. And that Yahweh is constant and unchanging. Friends, it means all that we know to be true of our eternal, glorious, holy, creator, God. Yahweh is one. And as we put all of this in verse 4 together, a feast is laid before our eyes. A declaration of Moses' theology of God. A summary of what it is for the people that is the very foundation of who they are and all that they do, therefore. It's a call to remember Yahweh as the covenant-making, covenant-keeping God who has redeemed his people, who established that covenant with them. And the one who has done this is supreme. There is no other besides him. Friend, do you know this is true for us as well? Do you know that as the Lord made a covenant with Israel and redeemed them from slavery and drew them into relationship with himself, did you know that he's done the same thing for us who have believed in his son? Of course, the context and the scope of this has changed a little bit, right? Because as the Israelites were enslaved in Egypt, all of humanity is enslaved in sin and death. But our merciful God has made a covenant. A covenant first with Israel at Sinai. And a new covenant with us. A covenant ratified in the blood of his own son. So that all who believe in this son can know God as their father so that, friends, we too can say, the Lord, our God. And the one who's done this for us, the one who has rescued us from this sin and death, is the supreme one, the almighty one, the same one. Which is why in Philippians chapter 2, Paul says of the Lord Jesus Christ that though he was in the form of God, he did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, to be held onto. But he emptied himself by taking on the form of a servant. Being born in the likeness of men and being found in human form, he humbled himself to the point of death, even death on a cross. And by simply believing, simply believing, that you are enslaved to that sin, that you are unable to free yourself. And by believing in Christ as the supreme creator God and that in him God humbled himself to die on a cross to pay your penalty, you too can enter into this covenant and you can join in that declaration, the Lord our God, the Lord my God. Though eternal, supreme God, the Son, Jesus Christ, 
left his throne to suffer and die, that through him we might have a relationship with our triune God forever. The Lord our God, the Lord is one. And that is the motivation behind Israel's life and faith. And in Christ, this is the foundation, friends, for our lives too. The supreme and matchless Lord of all has redeemed his people and made a way for us to have a relationship with him. It's the foundation. So as we think back to that daily questioning that Roseanne and I get each morning, what are you doing and why are you doing it? We realize that those questions may actually be in the reverse order. Perhaps, like our passage, we should be starting out with the why and not the what. And this actually isn't out of the ordinary for Scripture. Right? Our text reflects a pattern that's seen all throughout the Bible, a move from creed to call. A move from the knowledge of who God is to right living before him. The why and then the what. Take a look this afternoon at one of Paul's letters. And if you read it right through, you'll learn right very quickly that he so often begins with the why, the gospel, who God is and what he's done to save us. And then he moves to the what, to how we should be living in light of that, right? As in the New Testament, so we see in Deuteronomy. We begin with the motivation, salvation freely given by a supreme God. The foundation for all that we do is that the Lord is our God and he is one. Isn't it a joy that God tells us why? Now, I hope you're thinking, if that's the why, then where's the what? <laughs> well, that's exactly what we get in verse 5. But knowing what we know about the book of Deuteronomy, maybe what we think about the Old Testament as a whole, and what we've already seen in the first couple of words of these verses, we might be anticipating something to come next, right? Right? We might be anticipating, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall obey my law. Which, of course, he would be perfectly in the right to say, wouldn't he? But that's not what we get. What do we see? You shall love. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, and with all your soul, and with all your might. So the declaration in verse 4 is followed by a command that couldn't be any more personal. You shall love. But what does Moses mean by love? Right? Many people look at these ancient Near Eastern treaty texts, the ultimate cure for insomnia. Right? And, be, and we see that in, in those texts, love is a, a nation that has conquered a weaker nation and has commanded it to respect it. You will obey me. You will love me. It's this robotic, it's very unemotional. Is that the love that's being called for here? Not exactly. You see, elsewhere in the Old Testament, we see the same term referring to Abraham's parental love for Isaac. I'm sure parents out there know that that kind of love is not unemotional and robotic. It also refers to the brotherly love that Jonathan has for David. It's also the kind of reverential love that people have for their king, right? This doesn't sound like unemotional or robotic submission. This kind of love is affective. Now, while this love is not void of emotion, it's also not mere emotion, right? Because the love that's being called for is a response to something that God has done, how he's shown his love for us in doing something for us first. Remember, the what follows the why. So this sort of love is actually rooted in a covenant commitment, we can call it. Listen to the, how the love of Yahweh for his people is described just one chapter later in Deuteronomy 7. It says, It was not because you were more in number than any other people that the Lord set his love on you and chose you, for you were the fewest of all peoples. It was because Yahweh loves you and is keeping the oath that he swore to your fathers that Yahweh has brought you out with a mighty hand and redeemed you from the house of slavery. See, this tells us that God's love is not rooted in anything so great about his people. It's his own commitment to uphold a promise. See, there's, there's no honeymoon phase then to God's love. 
Isn't that a good thing? He chose to love his people, and that love was then expressed in action for that people's good. That's actually a really good definition of love for the whole Bible. Biblical love is the sacrificial commitment to the good of another. That's what love is in the Bible, the sacrificial commitment to the good of another. And this is the kind of love that God has for his people. And his people are simply called to then offer that love back to him as a response of gratitude, a response that's expressed in what we might call wholehearted, full-bodied commitment. Now, I think those come from our texts. Because look back there with me. It carefully qualifies that love for us. The first thing that we see is, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart. Let's start there. Now, in the Old Testament worldview, the heart was where one would, yes, feel emotion and joy and pain. You could feel those things in your heart. But primarily, the heart was the seat of all of one's intellectual activity. It was where wisdom dwelled. It was where one would make decisions. It was where one discerns truth from error. It's your internal self. It's your thoughts, your will, your desires. You are to love the Lord your God with all that is within you, with your mind and with your affections. Mind is actually probably a better way of understanding this. So, students, that means that even if you aren't huge fans of school, you can love God with all your heart by recognizing that all truth is God's truth and that he's given you an opportunity and the means to worship him as you learn, to study all things, to study, to seek things out and to bring him great glory the more you learn. You also to, can love God with what you dwell on, what you daydream about. We love him with our minds by meditating upon him and his goodness. Ultimately, that's where we're going to find true joy and peace anyway, right? You'll notice that actually, just going back to what we read earlier in Mark chapter 12, have you ever wondered why Jesus adds something in? Because here it says, you shall love the Lord your God with all of your heart, soul, and strength. And what does Jesus say? You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Did Jesus get it wrong? No. This is an exposition of the passage. He's trying to help people understand that the mind is not divorced from the heart, friends. This isn't just emotion without thought. We love him with our minds. Next, the text calls God's people to love him with all of their soul. Now, what does that mean? Again, if you were to look at all of the uses of this word in the Old Testament, you'd find that it doesn't actually refer most of the time to this immaterial part of us that can be separated from our body. See, in the Old Testament, you don't have a soul. You are a soul. It is your whole embodied life. So, you are to love God with all that you are, your entire living embodied person. So that means that part of loving him is how we reflect him in the world, right? How we present ourselves matters. How we act matters. All that is associated with our lives is to reflect our love for God. And finally, we are to love him with all our might, the text says. Another tricky one. Because this word is actually an adverb for grammar nerds out there like myself. An adverb. It means very. It's actually the same thing that's used when in creation God says what he created was very good. So this is like Moses is saying, I, you shall love the Lord your God with all of your very. With all of your muchness. It's like let's just try to capture everything we can possibly think of at this moment. Maybe a better way to capture it in English would be with all of your excess, with everything left over, with all of your resources. So yes, this can of course include physical strength, but it can also have in mind economic and social strength, God-given abilities, time, possessions. You're to love him with all the extra resources that he's given you, with your spare time, with your talents. Do you see the movement? So the people of God are to love him holistically from the inside out. 
with all of our internal cognitive faculties, with all of our embodied lives, with all of our gifts and our resources, with every sphere of who we are, we are to love him. Do you love him like that? I know I don't. And because we live in a fallen world, do you know even our very best attempts to love the Lord our God in this way will ultimately fall short. Several years ago, Roseanne and I went for a walk after dinner. Not 10 minutes of peace flew by before this dear older woman came frantically running to us with a dogless leash in her hand and said that she had told her daughter she wanted to help by taking the dog for a walk and things had not gone as planned. But Roseanne and I were ready to help, no fear. Desperate to show this woman the love of Christ, we sprang into action and we ran back home and we jumped in the car to start driving around in search of the fugitive canine. We drove around for some time and it was starting to get dark. Hope was quickly fading, but we said one final prayer and we turned into one final neighborhood. And wouldn't you know it, there it was. A beautiful dog strutting down the sidewalk. We couldn't believe our eyes. I slowly pulled up next to the dog and with the help of some kind bystanders, we wrangled it into the back seat of my Jetta and we proceeded to give the woman a call. The woman answered the phone, and before we could get a word in, with a voice of elation, she told us that the dog had made its own way home. <laughs> and that she couldn't have been more grateful for our willingness to help. <laughs> now, of course, Roseanne and I were thrilled for that woman, but our excitement quickly dissipated when a faint panting sound came from the back seat and reminded us that we had someone else's dog in the back seat of our car. So we continued driving and eventually we came across another dog owner, I kid you not, who was out searching for their lost dog. <laughs> and the prodigal dog was returned. Here's the thing, friends. This love that's being called for in verse 5, it is so rich so expansive, so holistic, so vast, that when it comes down to it, despite our very best efforts, we're still going to get the wrong dog. And that would be incredibly bad news for us if I stopped there. If the motivation for loving God with all of our heart, and with all of our soul, and with all of our might, is it all rooted in a desire to impress or to earn favor with God? Friends, our efforts are in vain. But the what follows the why. Our efforts at loving God, which absolutely includes loving others, could never save us. But praise be to God that our redemption is not earned by our ability to love Him completely. Our love for him is a response of gratitude for how completely he's loved us. What are you doing? And why are you doing it? My hope in prayer, friends, is that we have seen the importance of these questions. Questions that are at the very foundation of what it means to be the people of God and questions that do have biblical answers. Though these questions might strike each of us just a little bit differently. Because for some of us, these questions might be reorienting. They might be convicting you of the fact that if you were really honest with yourself, your pursuits and motivations might be just a little bit out of check. Please carefully consider what you're doing and why you're doing it. Does it line up with what we've seen this morning? Are your pursuits self-serving? Or are they a means of loving God motivated by the love that God has shown you? This is where you're going to find true joy and peace, friend. For others, these questions might be revealing. Maybe you've been trying to find north with a broken compass and you simply need a heading to follow. You need help to make a decision on what you should be doing and why, because you feel lost. For you, friend, the word of God gives you your heading. The foundation for the Christian life is wholehearted, full-bodied love, returned to God in gratitude, not to earn his favor but motivated by the truth that you've been redeemed by a supreme God of the universe.
so long as what you are pursuing and why you are pursuing it aligns with these objectives, you're on the right track. Just do something. Still for others, these might be revitalizing. Maybe you feel like you've been en route for a while now and you just need a reminder that you're on the right path and that by God's grace, you're making progress. None of us are going to do this perfectly. But friends, if you are prayerfully considering what you are doing and why you are doing it, and you're finding life in joy, in loving the Lord, serving others, seeking his face out of gratitude for all that he's done for you, I want you to be encouraged. The Lord is at work in your life. So as you are stopped at that red light on your way to work tomorrow, as you're walking to school, as you are up with the little ones tonight, or even this morning as you reflect after this service, ask yourself, what am I doing? And why am I doing it? And I hope and pray that in light of Deuteronomy 6, verses 4 and 5, your answers to these questions might be just a little bit clearer. Why don't I pray? Again, almighty and everlasting God, we come into your presence now with joy and thanksgiving that we don't have to earn it. We thank you, Father, that the what follows the why. And whether these questions are reorienting, revealing, or revitalizing for people here today, I just pray that they would be encouraged to seek you, that to be known by you and to know you is the greatest joy in this life. In Christ's precious name, amen.